Folks, I'm with my friend Lee Steinberg, and I've known Lee since, I think, 1998. Let's take the I think out of my head, because for the viewers who don't know, I Lee helped me first with the Super Bowl, then he helped L.U. Harris on the A's situation just as I was arriving, and we've been friends ever since. But Lee's... I'm really excited because, Lee, you're back. I, I I just want to say it just like that, is to get that smile from you. <laughs> but let's let's talk about first Paxton Lynch, the quarterback, your new client out of Memphis. And first of all, how did it come that you were able to meet Paxton Lynch and he became your client? David Lynch's father actually called us back in October of 2014 to in an effort to try to assemble information, knowing that Paxton was one day going to be someone that would want to play pro football. Little did we know that he would, a year later, be the top-ranked quarterback, prospectively, for the 2016 draft. As you know, our focus in our practice is on role modeling, an athlete retracing his roots to the high school community, collegiate community, setting up a high school scholarship fund, repaying his college scholarship, then setting up a charitable foundation, uh, trying to make a difference in the world. He was really excited about all of that, uh, David the father. And so we spent time with the family, very close family, uh, father David, mother Stacy, uh, brother Evan, who's a pitcher at Stetson, and had a meeting with Paxson this summer, for a couple hours and didn't meet with him again until basically after the season. Um, and it was a, a mesh of values. And as you know, players picked at the top of the first round have been my specialty over the last 42 years now. I've had the first pick in the first round of the draft in eight separate years. And franchise quarterbacks have been a particular specialty, all the way from Steve Barkowski to Steve Young to Warren Moon to Troy Aikman to Ben Roethlisberger. So it was a real fit in, in that sense. And so yesterday uh, we made it official, and he announced his intention to forego his uh, last year and enter the 2016 draft. Now looking at the video of Paxton, he reminds me personally of Brock Osweiler with Denver Broncos. And what, from your point of view, are his attributes? Well, first of all, he's 6'7", 245 <laughs> pounds. So the new mode in the NFL, if you look at the past season, it really was Cam Newton who in many ways was dominant and may win the MVP. Ben Roethlisberger doesn't quite have the running ability, but they're both huge quarterbacks who have the ability to be pinpoint passers, but they can get out of the pocket and, in Ben's case, move and throw on the run. In Cam's case, move, throw on the run, or run, and uh, be a multi-purpose threat. They also have the ability on third and one to just stretch out over the middle and convert that down. So this is the new mode, and Paxton fits that. He can throw uh, a big lead out. He can throw a mid-level out. He's got a touch on the deep ball. He's also a natural leader. His teammates love him. Uh, his roommates were at the press conference yesterday. So he's got all that. In today's football, it's so quarterback-centric. Without a franchise quarterback, that's someone that a team can build around for 10 to 12 years, who they win because of rather than with, and who can elevate his level of play in critical situations, especially adversity, to put a team on his back, take them through the playoffs to the Super Bowl. Without that player, it is extremely difficult to be competitive at the highest level. And there are a number of teams looking in this year's draft. You know what I thought was interesting, too, is that I looked at his videos from 2015 and 2014, and I read a, I'll just say it, I read an article by Bucky Brooks of NFL Network who said that Paxton Lynch wasn't NFL ready, and I read it entirely, and I read it twice, and I thought, that's completely wrong, and I'll say why it's completely wrong. First of all, the offense, this is just me from observation, that 
Paxton ran in Memphis is very much like much of what the Raiders have done this year under Bill Musgrave. Chip Kelly with the Eagles. Elements of it have come into the offenses of Dallas at New York. Especially Panthers with Cam Newton. I can go on and on and on. So Bucky, I'm just going to say this in video, is, is completely wrong. And I don't know if he just did that to be mean or what. But I, I, I say that because we're getting to this, I call it silly season, Lee. And the silly season is that a person doesn't honestly evaluate a quarterback, but they do so with this hidden bias that then comes out in, in evaluations that are completely ridiculous. And that was one of them. You know, and I, I'm saying that. I don't, I don't want to get you in trouble. I'm just saying that. Cause, oh, oh look, I don't think any college quarterback's ready for the NFL. The game is so much faster. The defenses are so much more complex. And frankly, the new system does a disservice to them all because of the way the cap's arranged and the fact that rookies get big signing bonuses and big cap numbers if they're picked at the top of the first round. It forces them to play when they're not ready. Mm -hmm. And so... We've seen over and over again, even if they come out with a big first year like a Colin Kaepernick or an RG3, they can fall back because they're doing it on their arm. It just takes time to adjust so that when you have someone like an Aaron Rodgers who sits and learns on the bench or Carson Palmer did the same thing, they're ahead because they've had the opportunity to have a more um, uh, gradual process of, of integrating into the game. Hey, you, you're an expert on this because you've handled arguably more quarterbacks than the other agent, more top quarterbacks. Why is it that it seems to me, and correct me if you think that I'm wrong, that, because it goes to my evaluation of Paxton, that NFL offenses have become more like their college counterparts and perhaps because of changes in the collective bargaining agreement combined. No, exchanges in college football. Remember that uh, when you and I were growing up, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them ran wishbones, they ran uh, what you saw Navy run this year with multiple options. Uh, all of a sudden those offenses went to pro set and, and they became uh, mirrors of uh, pro offenses. So they're running the same offense. Now some of the quarterbacks play under center, some of them play uh, uh, and more out of a shotgun, but the point is that, that, that those footballs become a passing game at the college level where large parts of the country used to run, run, run. Yeah, and, and the other thing I like about Pax is he has a howitzer for an arm, and it looks like even if he got strong in the weight room, there's a video I found that told me I don't think he needs to work out that much. If I'm not mistaken, he's throwing the football. Is it the length of a football field? It's a little clip, like 10 seconds. I mean, he's got that ability. And so you've got someone with, with that arm. But what's amazing is that it's his size, he can so effortlessly escape the pocket. So we have a long scouting procedure to go through. Virtually all of these players now go... The minute the bowl games are over, they go off to training for about five or six weeks in a specialized setting. They work with a quarterback coach. He's just on the way this weekend to look at two or three training facilities and quarterback experts. They work on strength. They go into high nutrition programs. They uh, work on uh, fundamentals and, and techniques. And then they go off to the scouting combine where they're weighed and measured. They have 20-minute one-on-one sessions with teams where their character and their temperament is tested. They have the ability to go through five testing drills, how fast they run a 40, what their vertical leap is like, and then they can throw. And then once the combine is over, they have the ability to do all those same drills. And for a quarterback, the kernel, the essence, the vortex of the whole thing is a 40-minute roughly throwing session on their college campus on pro scouting days called uh, where they make all the basic throws and aesthetically what you're looking for is that the ball doesn't ever hit the ground. 
and done well it's a thing of beauty and then it graduates to individual teams being highly focused on who they're going to take and in the last part of it a team can have as many as 30 players come visit their facilities no workouts and their interest homes and homes and homes and the key to scouting is having a a few teams fall in love with their player and specifically envision him as the player that could take their franchise. Now, are you going to have Paxton throw at the combine? Not sure yet. Uh, the downside of it is that the player isn't throwing to his own receivers, so it doesn't look quite as good. Uh, the upside is that you have every last director of player personnel, head coach, scout, executive in the front office and many many owners there so if you can do it well you never have to do it again however every top quarterback in years has always thrown on pro scouting days so that's the key day for throwing but every player has to show up at the combine and do the drills and do the physical and, and do the 20 minute interviews i asked because when Jameis winston threw at the combine he did extremely well he did so well that it became a worldwide Twitter trend because in the state of social media, you know, you can really blow up. That's why that's the other reason why I ask. So Paxton is also perfect because it seems like he is someone that's interested in community service, and that's a big deal with you, right? It's really a requirement, and what what I'm looking to do in the world is to try to make a positive change. And athletes have this critical role because they can trigger imitative behavior. Take an issue like domestic violence. When I had the heavyweight champion Lennox Lewis say, real men don't hit women, it can do more to change the behavioral attitudes towards domestic violence in rebellious athletes, excuse me, rebellious adolescents than a thousand authority figures ever could. So we're done the former running back with Tampa and Atlanta has a program we set up called Homes for the Holidays where we just moved the 145th single mother and her family into the first home they'll ever own <coughs> by making the down payment and having Home Depot outfit. So it's... Warwick done? Work done. Mm -hmm. So it's really critical um, that these athletes retrace their roots. It's also the genesis of second career because what happens is they start to be seen for their non-athletic skills, and they're able to um, network, and they meet people that can help them as they go on. So, um, Ward Dunn's now a minority owner of the Atlanta Falcons. Um, Drawn Cherry, who had the Cherry Foundation, then became the owner of the Anheuser Bush distributorship in Kansas City. He became a minority owner of his team. In the Bay Area, um, uh, people like Steve Young and Brent Jones use the people they met in Silicon Valley. Brent Jones has a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. So um, it's looking at Matthew holistically and seeing how to craft a program for them, not just for while they're playing, but for second career. Now, I'm going to transition here because we could talk about Paxton quite a bit, but you have a new client as well. Actually, it's... Two third, two legs of a triplet. That's how I like to think of it. But Paxton to finish, he threw for three thousand seven hundred seventy-eight yards, twenty-eight touchdowns, and just four interceptions this year. That's that's incredible. Congratulations, Lee. Daniel Lasco, as this old blue will tell you, is one of the best running backs in Cal history. He is also credited with the longest play from scrimmage in Cal history, ninety-two yards against Colorado. And he is the most prolific active runner. Well, he's about to be deactivated, but active runner. Uh, and Cal, that's Daniel Lasco. How did Lasco come to be uh, your client? Congratulations. Thanks. And I have to say, go Bears. Uh, there you go. And, you know, someone who went to Cal, built his career at the beginning on Cal football, it's especially gratifying. Daniel's a high character young man. Um, Graduated, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago from Cal. Uh, met his grandfather 
uh, John Coniglio, who was running their process, uh, shared the different values. There was a values match there. And uh, Daniel is someone who was injured this year, had some nagging injuries. If you look to the season before, he gained 1,100 yards. Right. Uh, this year, Cal also went to a more rotational system where they kept putting the wide receivers and running backs in and out like modular parts. But um, he is an every down running back. He has the capacity to break away. He's very fast. He can catch the ball well. Um, he can return and, and play special teams. He's got so many different aspects to him. And... Uh, I think you're going to see him in the pros much more like he was in his sophomore and junior year. When he gets a chance to touch the ball, because these players need rhythm. Now, I've represented uh, Ricky Williams and Edger and James and Thurman Thomas um, and Daryl Johnson, a whole series of running backs. And uh, we didn't see the best of Daniel Lasko this year. We saw it the year prior. And I think that's what you're going to see in the uh, pros. And he'll go uh, to Exos and Carlsbad to train. Now, is he going to be in the combine as well, Daniel? Because I know Cal has well, a program. I'm, I'm quite sure. He's going to play in the East-West game. He's a senior, so he can play in an all-star game. Those games are heavily scouted. They're really only uh, roughly four practices, so they have to treat each practice just like it was a game. I have to give Daniel this props, too, because he is a high honors student and has really set the example for the kind of student-athlete that we've been trying to promote at Cal, who does well both on the field and off the field in the classroom, and, of course, especially with you out in the community. So that's... that's well, he's really theory. popular with his teammates. He was voted MVP by his teammates. And, uh, you know, with the team, obviously, with a great quarterback and a lot of other players. But, yep. um, and he's a very team-oriented uh, player. So um, I think you can expect things. And, and look, uh, he comes out of a heritage of, uh, you know, Marshawn Lynch mm -hmm. and Justin Forsett. And Cal's had a few running backs. Yeah, Shane, he reminds me, in a way, of Shane Vereen out of the backfield, you know, uh, when he catches the ball. So... I mean, I don't want to name a team or anything, or get, but I just can see about five or six teams off the top of my head that would do very well with, with Daniel Lasko. I really do. Now, uh, congratulations to Daniel. I say again, go Bears.